find some kind of middle ground when you're starting out so that you're not working yourself to death for free and you're not totally pricing yourself out of competition with most everyone in your field. This is the How to Quit Working Show. Jeff Steinman believes entrepreneurship is the only true path to freedom. That's why he created the How to Quit Working Show, where you'll hear stories, insights, and inspiration from lifestyle fanatics who left their soul-sucking 9-to-5 job forever. Now, here's your host, author, entrepreneur, and ultimate lifestyle fanatic, Jeff Steinman. Hello and welcome to the How to Quit Working Show. Today we're going to be talking about how to take the skills that you already have, the skills that some employer is already paying you for, and leveraging those for freelancing and consulting work. We're going to be talking to Diana Schneidman, who has done it. She's the author of Real Skills, Real Income, which is a book all about just that. And she's going to share her best stuff with us here on the show. I'm really excited about this because, you know, freelancing and consulting is really the fastest way to bring money in so that you can quit your job. Even if it's not the ideal thing that you want to do, uh, it's a really good, quick way. And we talk to a lot of guests who have used that uh, in fact, I have another uh, show upcoming uh, where the guest talks even more about how she used that skill to bring in the money that she needed and get a more flexible lifestyle so that she could build the business that she really wanted to build. So this is a really important topic. And I also want to ask you, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not a graphic designer or I'm not a writer, so I don't have any skills that I can freelance – Put those thoughts out of your mind. Open your mind up a little bit because – well, open your mind up a lot because there's a lot of possibility out there that is not necessarily blatantly obvious. So remember that there is a ton, a ton, a ton of possibility in the world, a lot of different ways that you can approach this. So open your mind up. Now, before we get into talking to, to Diana, I want to invite you over to the Facebook group where you can talk with other people just like you, make friends, make acquaintances, maybe even make some business relationships, bounce ideas off of folks, and do it in the complete privacy of Facebook. It is a closed group, which means that nobody can see anything that you post except the people in the group, and nobody also is able to see that you are a member of the group. So it's all completely private, uh, so the only people that can see uh, what you post and that you're a member of the group are the people who are in the group, and those people are not going to rat you out. So don't worry about them. They're all cool How to Quit Working people. So go to howtoquitworking.com slash group and jump in the conversation, and let's start talking about what skills you can take out to the world, what value you provide to the world. It's a great place. I love hanging out there. We have lots of fun and lots of great conversation. Now, let's talk to Diana Schneidman about how to quit your job and begin freelancing or consulting. Diana, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> Looking forward to talking to you today because you are an expert on this whole idea of quitting your job and getting consulting work. And I think that it's such a fast way to to actually replace your income and, and quit working for somebody else and be your own boss. Now you're the author of a book and I love I love the title of your book. It's Real Skills, Real Income, a proven marketing system to land well paid freelance and consulting work in thirty days or less. And I want you to tell us all about that. But first, tell us a little bit about your journey. I know you worked a job and you left that job and became a consultant. Tell us a little bit about why you did that and how you went about it. Well, it's a, it's a little different, actually. The job left me. Ah, we hear that so often on the show. Right. So the first time that I started freelancing was quite a while back. It was about 20 years ago. And I was on disability leave, and I'm fine now. But anyway, when I went back to work, the job had already been filled. Mm -hmm. So there I was. So I had always wanted to try freelancing, and this was the perfect opportunity. And my first client was my previous employer. So that's, cool. yeah, it was. That's a good way to kind of stick it to them. <laughs> Well, we had a good relationship, and it was a good assignment, so it worked out well. So that was my first experience with freelancing. And then in the years past, I have had periods where I've had regular employment. 
I would get frustrated with freelancing and the instability of it. And also, I really needed health insurance. And so I would get a full-time job. And those jobs just didn't work out. I worked very hard. And I think I did an excellent job. And I really held my tongue. But I think if you're the type of person who really should be self-employed, you sometimes run into personality conflicts no matter how hard you try and control yourself and manage the situation. So, Yeah, that's for sure. I know a lot of our listeners identify with that whole concept of the frustration of the things that you have to deal with when you're working for somebody else. Well, tell us a little bit about how, how does one go about leaving their job and landing, as you say in your book, well-paid freelance and consulting work in 30 days or less? It's ideal if you have some money behind you when you resign, but for many people that's not the case. Of course, I had unemployment compensation, but um, act, and actually I was looking for, part during parts of these periods, I was actually looking for a job at the same time. Mm-hmm. And eventually I decided to just stick with the freelancing. And what you really have to do is you have to have a marketing plan in place and you have to be ready to market Mm -hmm. from day one. And just continuing to network with the people you already know is probably insufficient unless you have a very specialized niche and you have very good uh, acquaintances. Oh, no, I want to pull something out. You said networking, just networking with the people that you already know is probably insufficient. Does that mean, Diana, we have to go out and talk to strangers? Well, that's what I recommend. And actually, (laughs) that's what my process is. I have a, a system that I developed over time. And what happened during my career is I did have periods of full time employment. And during those periods, my freelance my freelance assignments became fewer and fewer because I wasn't really marketing and I didn't have that much time to do additional assignments. So every time I left a full-time job, I had to start marketing almost from scratch. Uh, So you had to start like building the whole building from the foundation each time that you kind of got back into that. Definitely. And another thing that you'll find in freelancing is that You lose clients. No matter how good your service is, you will lose clients over time. Sometimes it's because your contact person goes on to another company. Sometimes they hire someone full-time internally. Sometimes they just want to change things for the sake of change. And since you're associated with the old, then you're out. So you always have to be marketing, no matter how good your current clients are. And you have to always be ready for what may lie ahead. So tell us what is what is marketing for a freelancer or a consultant? What does that mean and how do you how does one do that? Well, I think it's a three step process. Oh, we love three step process. Three steps, yes. <laughs> yes. The first is you have to decide what service you're going to offer. And I recommend generally you look at what you did in your last good job. And you determine how that can turn into a freelance business. So it has to do with what you're good at, what you enjoy, what you enjoy doing, what you have experience at, and you have samples of depending on what kind of work you offer. Mm. So I think it's easiest if you do something that you've already done in the past. And the alternative is to do something you really love which may work, it may work, but if you don't have clients already and you don't have an established business, it's much easier to offer a service that you've already done professionally because you really understand what you're getting into and you have a better sense of how to monetize it. So that's the first step is to decide what you're going to do. The second step is to start contacting people. And I favor doing it directly, and I favor picking up the phone. and Oh, my gosh, the phone, talking to people. Isn't that so outdated? Well, no. (laughs) No, (laughs) I'm not outdated. Um, Because 
because it works. Now, you know, you could think of this as telemarketing, which has a really bad reputation. Yeah. Especially here in the United States, we're just out of the political season, and I've received so many nuisance phone calls. Mm -hmm. But what I'm recommending is that you do it yourself. And because you're not bothering people, you, you're calling the right people, and you're doing it yourself. And by the way, I only do it during work hours. I do not call people very early or very late in the day on the assumption that they're available. And there's a few reasons for this. One is that a lot of people do all their all their life on their cell phone. And so you, you don't know where they are, and you could be calling them at very inappropriate times, and you could be a real nuisance. Sure. I feel if you're making calls about work, you should call people on their office line, if you know what it is, or their cell phone, if that's what they're using but doing it during work hours. And then you're not being a nuisance. And also, in the United States, there is not do no, there is no do not call list that applies to businesses. You are allowed to call businesses. Yep. That's a really so, good point. So when you're calling other businesses to solicit your services to businesses that do not call regulations, do not apply to you. That's right. That's so right. Don't worry. So listeners, don't worry about that. The most important thing is you have to get your mind in the right place to do this. Because if you see yourself as a nuisance, then that's what you are. Oh, now that's interesting. So you're saying before before you can make a successful call, you you have to view yourself not as being a nuisance. What's the right way, Diana, to view yourself? I see myself as a helper. And one of the reasons I feel this way is that I'm very selective about who I call. Mm -hmm. I'm not just calling, I'm not just using a telemarketer and paying them. When you have someone else doing it at a nominal fee per call, then it's easy to just give them some crazy list, hand them the yellow pages or something and tell them to go at it. When you're making the calls yourself, you want to be wiser about how you use your time and so you're pretty selective in who you're calling so that they're more likely to be someone who needs your services and then you're calling to offer now there's a lot of different problems you can be solving but generally the kind of work that i do and that many other freelancers do is probably the same thing that the person you are calling either does or manages and no one has enough time. Everybody's always saying how busy they are. And so what I'm really offering them is I'm offering them more time because I'm available to step in and help them fulfill their, the responsibilities that they have. Excellent, excellent. So the next thing is you start by contacting people and view yourself as a helper, not as a nuisance. Right. What is the third step? The third step is to get real. It's going to take quite a few calls. Ah. But, you know, that's true of every marketing system. If you're networking, you're not going to go to just one meeting and then have a full practice. You're not going to be on one LinkedIn group for a limited period of time and develop a practice. You can do Facebook, but it takes a lot of Facebooking. And it takes very strategic <laughs> Facebooking in order to get clients. Any type of marketing takes a lot of effort. And telephoning is no different. Excellent. Well, how, how do you know? You made some really good points about being selective about who you call. How do you know who in the heck to call and who not to waste your time with? Because I, lo I think you make a really good point in that, yeah, marketing is a lot of work. And if you're working a job and trying to build a consulting practice, you don't have a lot of time to waste. So you, you do have to make the right calls to the right people. So how do you figure out who those people are? Well, that's why you want to do something that you have work experience in, because you know the title of the person at your company. You may know people at other companies who are doing similar work. So that gives you some sort of feel for how the organization is structured and what job titles you're going after. But you're still not always going to hit it quite right. It's more important to be selective in which companies you're calling 
than which individuals. Mm. And in my experience, it's better to go after, generally speaking, somewhat larger companies because... Oh, interesting. Well, you know, this, there's some wonderful assignments through single proprietor businesses, and it's possible to be very happy and successful with get that kind of work. But the great thing about a larger company is that they have they tend to have a budget, and they have to spend this budget. And another thing that's good about a larger company is that your invoice is being processed by accounting, which is on another floor. So the very best clients are pretty large companies where the invoice is being sent to some other department and the service user does not feel like they're paying money out of their own pocket. And that's the problem with a very small business. You're literally taking money out of their checking account. And that, that a lot of times they'll really be intrigued with what you offer and very interested. But when it comes to really contracting with you for work and paying you, there may be problems. Well, now that's really an interesting perspective, Diana. So what you're saying is a larger company has a budget already set aside for literally everything that they do. So there's already money there and ready to be allocated. And there's not somebody, the decision maker isn't necessarily looking over the checkbook and worried about writing that check. Right, right. What are the downsides? You know, so, go ahead. The downsides, you mean the downsides of a larger company? Uh, well, f go ahead and finish making the point you were going to make, and then I want to ask you what the downsides are of working with a larger company. When you're working with a very small concern, sometimes it's literally one person, and you think you're talking to the decision maker, and you sort of are, but it turns out that their spouse is also a decision <laughs> <laughs> the dreaded spouse, the dreaded I have to ask my husband or I have to ask my wife. Right. And they tend, they tend to be more negative because it's they're not as closely involved in the business. So they can they understand the dollars involved more than they understand the need for the service involved. Yeah. You're spending how much on that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the downsides of working with a larger company. The downsides of working with a larger company is that the same downsides <laughs> that you have when you're working in a larger company, mm. you know, uh, sometimes there's a lot of people involved in the decision-making process, or there's a lot of people involved in the work process. And also the, the, the use of time is unpredictable. Sometimes they'll tell you, this is very high priority. We need to finish this in a week. And then somehow things totally turn around and it gets put on permanent hold or it gets stalled. And you're thinking, wait a second, you said this was so important. You know, maybe I set aside other work to work on this and now it's just kind of grinding to a halt. Yeah. So the bureaucratic stuff and all the annoying stuff that we deal with as employees inside corporate is is also applicable when we're working with a, a corporate client. It sounds like is what I'm hearing you say. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool, cool. Well, d tell us a little bit about, like, if, if, I, was a, if I was a person in the, in the corporate world or, or working any 9-to-5 job and I had a skill that I provide to that company and I said, you know what, I think I want to take this skill and I want to take it freelance. I want to do this independently. What's the first thing that you would tell somebody to do? The first thing you have to know is are you really going to leave the company soon or is, are you seeing this as a long-term process that you're working towards? And that's going to handle how probably how you handle things. And you have to know if there's a conflict of interest. And then this is a very important topic. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because if you're doing the very same thing for one company, are you going to take that over to competitors and offer the same service? Mm. So if you're doing marketing for Coca-Cola, 
would it be a conflict of interest to go do marketing for Pepsi? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> it depends. Some people have actually signed uh, signed agreements that they're not going to work with a competitor. So if you have a, an agreement, that's certainly going to affect your decision. The if if you don't have those issues, there's it, it depends on the individual circumstance. You know, instead of if you work with Coke, that doesn't mean you have to work for Pepsi. Perhaps you would want to work for a fruit juice company mm-hmm. or a um, snack company or Probably as you really get into freelancing, you're going to want to define yourself a little b- more broadly than that because there only are so many uh, like cola products out there. Sure. So you've got to, you want to be very narrowly niched, but you don't have to get unnecessarily narrow so that it shrinks your market down to only a very limited number of competitors. So you want to think then of an area in which the, it's close enough that your that your um, experience is relevant, but not so far away that it's a conflict of interest. And then the other thing you've got to figure out is, is this a secret from your employer or is it not? Mm. And that's going to also affect how you do things because it's much easier if it's not a secret. But nowadays, everyone has a cell phone, so you can get calls at the office, but I don't like to take calls in an office where it's a big secret who I'm talking to because it's very hard to service your freelance clients without saying something that someone in the next cubicle might hear. Sure. So you're tempted just to go, just say, uh huh, uh huh, I agree, yes. But that's not really carrying the project (laughs) forward. You have to be able to talk more openly. Right, right. Yeah, so you so you're recommending maybe taking those calls outside of the office or or well, and I think the the big question is how you got to decide if it's going to be a secret or not, and how how do you go about deciding if you should keep your freelance or other entrepreneurial desires a secret or if you should um, just be wide open about it? Well, you'll probably know because you know the office that you work in. Uh, And um, I've had, I've been in past situations where I worked in a full-time job and I did freelance in a totally different industry. There was no conflict of interest whatsoever. But I knew that a I knew that my boss would be jealous if she knew that I was being paid a substantial sum to do freelance work. And uh, so I just never told anybody. Mm. But then, you know, the problem is then if you're busy during daytime hours, then you have to figure out how you're going to serve clients. And sometimes you tell the, the freelance clients and they're okay with it. Sure. So that you either call them before work or during lunch or after work. Or maybe you go for, you might want to go for clients who are a few time zones different. So that if you're in New York and you get a client in California, there's a three hour time difference. So it means if you leave work at, at six, it's only three o'clock in California. So you can plan most of your work with them during this later time. Excellent, excellent. All about just sort of setting expectations and sometimes being just really upfront and candid with a consulting client about, hey, I work a full time job, so I gotta, you know, is it okay if we just communicate early in the morning or later in the evenings? That's right. That's and right. I, I would imagine as long as you you get your work done for them and you deliver quality work when you say you're going to deliver it, they're probably fine with that, right? Right, especially on the freelance side. I don't know that your employer is going to be quite so happy, though. <laughs> because that's a whole different ballgame, as we all right, know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell us, Diana, about some of the downsides of consulting or freelancing. Well, one of the downsides is you have to be marketing, and you're going to be marketing forever. You're going to be marketing until the day you quit or die. <laughs> 
And you might slow down a bit because once you have a full schedule, you, you don't maintain that same level of intensity with your marketing. And, but you really can't afford to just totally quit, even if you think you're very busy, because things can turn around in a moment. And one of the advantages of working in a regular office is you can, t- you can, you can get a sense of whether things are going sour by the way they treat you or by the way you're excluded from meetings or perhaps your performance appraisal, you can get a vibe for what's going on. Sure. But at a client, at an offsite client, you can't get this understanding of what's going on. So sometimes I've called for the next round of like a newsletter or something like that, and it's turned out that my contact is no longer there. Mm, so, and you have no way of knowing that until you try to make the phone call and can't get a hold of the person. That's right. I That's see. right. I see. What else? Another problem is sometimes is getting paid. And you have to structure things to get paid as much up front as possible. And then during the project, you do not want an arrangement where you only get paid at the end. Mm. Sometimes it works out. And it's also a matter of trusting your gut. Sometimes you get this feel that it'll work out. Or that's the way the client always does it. And it's a prestige name, so you want them in your portfolio. So I have made exceptions. But generally speaking, you want to get paid as much as possible up front. And some clients are very sensitive about this and very resistant. And if they're resistant, you have to figure out why they are resistant. And it might be because they don't have the money in hand right now. And so you don't want to fold on this kind of client and just go along with it because you sense that the problem is they don't have money. So if you do the whole project and you hand it in to them and they don't have the money, um, how are you going to get paid? That's not a good business model. (laughs) No, no. You still have bills to pay. Even if your client doesn't have the money, you still have the bills you have to pay. Cool. Any other downsides of freelancing you want to point out? You have to be very diligent about deadlines, and there's no one to push you along and except yourself. And uh, a lot of people find out when they're their own boss that they're the meanest boss in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're going to have to, uh, you, you end up um, sometimes putting pressure on yourself almost around the clock. Because, especially if you work at a home office, the day is never done. So you're sometimes working into the evening. And it's very important to be really on top of deadlines. Because it's not like an office where somebody understands or there's other things going on. That's another problem with freelancing. You have multiple clients, but they don't care that you have other clients. If you're in a regular job and you're not getting something done, you explain to your boss that you're doing something for someone else, and then you let them set the priority, and usually that works out pretty well. If you're self-employed with multiple clients... Each one feels like they're your only client. So it's, <laughs> it's harder to balance the work, and you have to be very conscientious in order to meet deadlines, and you really have to care about the deadlines. Another problem is when you work in an office and you come up with a technical problem, you have coworkers to bounce your ideas off of and to get input. Mm. When you're at In your own home office by yourself, you're trying to establish yourself as an expert so that you're paid respectably well. And yet you have to know it all already yourself because there's really no one to consult with. Sure. Sure. So you, I guess you kind of have to build up your own network of other people that do similar, maybe other freelancers. Have you had experience doing that, sort of building up your own network of sort of virtual coworkers, so to speak? I actually I have in Chicago there's an organization of freelance writers called I Walk Independent Writers of Chicago and I'm fairly active in that and I go to the meetings and it gives me an opportunity to interact with other people and there's a 
National Freelancers Union that pres provides some of this, and there's other groups as well. And so I find it helpful to do that, and also it's helpful to meet people in uh, complementary specialties. For instance, I'm a writer, and it's helpful to know, like, web designers and, you know, social media experts and photographers, th the kinds of specialties that you might need for a project that you're doing for a service that you don't supply yourself. Oh, so if you're doing writing for someone and maybe there needs to be some companion photography that goes along with it, maybe you're writing a story about somebody and you need a picture of that person since you're not a photographer, you're saying it's good to have a relationship with a photographer so that you could then refer that, that client, that to your client, that person to your client for, to get that work done. Well, that's right, Jeff. And also sometimes these people refer work, work to you. There's a lot of freelance writers who have relationships, for instance, with web designers. And so they provide copy for the websites. Beautiful, beautiful. So that's another way to promote your business and to get clients in the door. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Diana, let's talk a little bit about the financial stuff, the money part, the part that makes everybody cringe just to think about it. And the, the last couple shows and the couple we've got upcoming, we're going to be talking with our guests in, in much more, uh, much more directly and in much more detail about the, the money stuff. Cause I know that's one of the biggest things that our listeners worry about is how am I going to make the how am I going to pay the bills? Tell us a little bit about how you made the financial transition and what you recommend to other people for dealing with the money stuff. In my case, it was pretty rocky because I did not choose the time that I left the company. Mm. And so I really didn't have any work to fall back upon. And it was very difficult. So it's great if you can have a nest egg set aside before you start freelancing or if you can um, have a full-time job while you're starting out. Sure. The One of the biggest challenges is deciding how much to charge, and that gets harder all the time because the competition is worldwide. Mm. There's no way to, to identify who your competitor is as a whole. You might know who else is doing work for them for a specific client, but generally speaking, you have no idea who the competition is. They can be very experienced people, very new people. They can pe be people in your country. They can be people on the other side of the globe. So you're competing with a lot of people at very different skill levels and very different expectations. So you can't really base your pricing on the competition because that's not a clear enough indicator of where you should be at. You can't necessarily base it on your cost of living because clients really don't care what your cost of living is. And I think if, I think the best place to start is in the middle. And what I'm seeing in the marketplace is that there's a lot of people working for very, very low rates. And that's because of some of these electronic, um, uh, like, job board kinds of things for freelancers. Mm. And so you can see that some people are working at very low rates. And that might be useful if you want to get some portfolio samples at the beginning. But generally speaking, you don't want to price yourself too low because you'll be working yourself to death and still not making enough money. So the alternative, some people preach pricing yourself very high. But I think it takes, you really have to know the value of your service. It probably has to be a pretty specialized kind of service, and you have to have a proven level of effectiveness before you can command very high rates. Also, you need the stability of already having some work in order to have the confidence to, to name these very high rates to people because some of them will just say no, and that's totally to be expected. So I think that you want to find some kind of middle ground when you're starting out so that you're not working yourself to death for free and you're not totally pricing yourself out of competition with most everyone in your field. 
it's very much an art to decide how to price and it's also kind of a gut thing you have to you have to understand your own feelings and sort of get in touch with it in order to know how to price great great points around pricing there i think that diana do you agree with me that too many people just work for way too little money i suspect that's the case but what's curious is why they keep doing that i mean i can understand that if you haven't had any work and you're just getting started it might be a temptation and i think it gives you a little bit of a psychological satisfaction to at least be getting paying work perhaps for the first time in your life as a freelancer but it's a real shame when people continue to work at that level absolutely absolutely now diana let's talk about the finances for somebody who is working a full-time job and let's say they you know they their job is not in danger right so they they could stay there as long as they want as far as they know we, we there's no guarantees but their job is not in danger but they want to go out and they want to do something freelance what would you recommend to them while they're still working to get their marketing in place and to get their financial ducks in a row so that they can make that transition to get your financial ducks in a row, ideally, you would save money and pay off debt. Mm. And some people look for less expensive living arrangements, like smaller apartments and that roommates, that kind of thing, because it might take a while to get started. So if you just have a month or two of resources, that might not be sufficient. So you want to cut your expenses. Um, in terms of getting started... If you're going to be doing this for a while, you have to have a life that accommodates it. Mm. And you have to, I think, you have to be reasonable as to how much you can do on the side. Because you're going to really have to produce. And you're going to have to meet client expectations. And it depends on your age and your energy level. But there's only so much you can do at once unless you're a very high energy person you got to focus i think that's the, that is such a great point you got to focus focus and focus and when you're done focusing you got to focus some more <laughs> well that's a good point if you want to start building up your niche and your portfolio and not just be all over the place because somewhat desirable opportunities present themselves Sure, sure. Diana, I want to I want to uh, ask you to tell us a little bit about your book. But before you tell us about your book, tell us about what's what's the most important thing that you would want someone to know who's considering freelancing. The most important thing about freelancing is it's very easy to get demoralized. You, you have to be able to manage your emotions. You have to commit to marketing. You have to allow a little bit of time for success. But most of all, it's, it's, it's easy to get discouraged. And especially when you're working by yourself and perhaps home by yourself, things can look pretty dour. So mm. you have to be able to to manage that and keep yourself in motion and marketing and producing. Amazing, amazing advice. I think you summed it up so well. You said manage your emotions, focus on marketing, and give it some time to work. That's such great, great advice. Dana, tell us a little bit about your book, where we can go to get it, and where we can go to get more information about you. Well, my, my book is called Real Skills, Real Income. A Proven Marketing System to Land Well-Paid Freelance and Consulting Work in 30 Days or Less. And it's available on Amazon as both a Kindle ebook and also as a print book. And it tells you exactly what to do to start freelancing or consulting in almost any specialty. And since I recommend phoning, it tells you exactly what to say on the phone. And wow. how, yeah. So exactly. no getting, no getting tongue tied on the phone. No, no. In fact, after you make a few calls, you'll get so used to this. It, it comes very easily. And th so 
it's got a lot of scripts in it. What I think is really cool about the book is it has a list of everything to do on your first day in business. Oh, cool. And one of the things I recommend doing, if you don't already have a website, put that off a little bit because you can really spend a lot of time writing your website and it in itself doesn't bring in work. So just go ahead and fix up, fix up your LinkedIn profile and you can use that temporarily. I love it. I love it. Don't make putting up a website the very first thing that you do. It's such great advice and we don't hear that often enough. Too often we hear, put up a website right away, even though you don't know what the heck to put on it yet. <laughs> well, Mark Silver, one of the guys I worked with, says it takes 60 weeks to do a website. Mm. It takes 59 and a half weeks to think about it and three days to write it. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Diana, where can we go uh, on the web? My website is Stand Up Eight Times. Usually I use the numeral, but you can write it out too. Okay. So it's StandUp8Times.com. And I have a lot of articles there, and you can sign up for my free report on the three steps. And I generally write a newsletter a week. And uh, it's a lot of, mostly it's about how to freelance, how to do consulting. And lately I've been writing about how to do really good content so that you're not writing the same thing as everybody else and it shows some intelligence. Outstanding. Go to stand up eight times. You can use the number or you can spell it out, whatever you want to do. It's all going to be linked up below as well as Diana's book. Diana, thanks so much for coming on the show. You are a fountain of information about consulting and freelancing. I know we have a lot of listeners who want to do that, so I know they're going to go pick up your book. Thanks so much for coming on the show and so generously sharing this information and your experience and everything that you know. And I wish you the best of luck with everything you've got going on. Well, thank you, Jeff. Great advice from Diana Schneidman. You gotta just step out of the step out of the weeds and get creative and figure out what the heck kind of skill you've got that you can turn around and sell to people. That's all this is about. And Diana gave some really, really great advice. So go check out her website at Stand Up Eight Times and check out her book. All linked up below the show on howtoquitworking.com. And if you're ready to get really serious about creating a new amazing lifestyle for yourself, taking those skills that you have and the value that you provide to the world, or even just figuring out what that value is, reach out for How to Quit Working Coaching. You can get more information at howtoquitworking.com slash coaching. Contact Heather and schedule your complimentary one-on-one coaching session today. Again, howtoquitworking.com slash coaching. And again, we've got more folks coming up on the show who are going to talk specifically about how they made a financial transition from having uh, from working a job to having their own business next time on the How to Quit Working Show. And until then, thanks for joining us on the How to Quit Working Show. Tune in next time when we'll talk to another amazing person just like you who is now living the ultimate life of freedom and doing it on their terms. If you want to learn how to quit working and get these episodes delivered directly to you, visit howtoquitworkingshow.com.